You're probably feeling pretty scared right now. I think most people are. Coronavirus is spreading quickly around the world and there's a lot of signs of panic out there. People are panic buying, uh, people are panicking on social media. So although I, I want to get into the politics of all this, um, first I just want to give a message of calm. Whoever you are, even if you're an older person or you have an underlying health condition, you're probably going to be okay. Most people are going to be okay. Before we get into the politics, I wanted to look at the NHS advice. Top tip for any American viewers, the NHS website is fantastic. I find if I look up health advice on the internet, everything just says I probably have cancer. Except the NHS website because it's not trying to sell anything. So what do they say? Uh, wash your hands with soap often, soap, soap and water, uh, for at least 20 seconds. Use a hand sanitizer gel if you can't get soap. Soap kills the virus. So if you do a proper long wash of your hands with soap, you should clear it. Try not to touch your face. That can spread the virus into you. Uh, if you're sneezing, cover your mouth and nose with a tissue. I would add to that myself, uh, don't make any un unnecessary travel um, and if you have older or more vulnerable neighbours you could maybe ask them if you know, they need you to go to the shops for them that's, that's the best thing to do right now don't panic so most people have a fear of acquiring the virus I think a good way of doing it is to imagine that you do have the virus yeah, and change your behaviour so that you're not transmitting it don't think about changing a behaviour so you won't get it. Think about changing a behaviour so you don't give it to somebody else. But as we're going to see, this virus is very serious. So the first point on this is the death rates. Um, this is South Korean data. It's going to change over time. We, we don't actually know right now for certain how many infections there are. We don't have final figures in any of this. But what we're looking at here is the flu on the left, the flu you're used to, the you know, seasonal flu, compared to COVID-19 in South Korea. As you can see, the flu uh, kills almost nobody under 65. Uh, there's a few people die from it, but, you know, one in a hundred thousand of these younger ages, um, up to still less than one in a hundred people who get it at 65 plus. COVID-19 is a different matter. You, you're seeing one in a thousand, about, in the kind of 30 to 50 age range, um, rising rapidly from then until, for people who are 80 plus, it's, it's 8%. That's a that's tremendous number of people if this virus was to spread everywhere. I think sometimes we can be a bit dismissive of the deaths of older people. Um, I think that's really a, a very sad thing. I don't think that we should be doing that. Um, but if it, you know, if it helps, Patrick Stewart's in his 70s, and uh, if Patrick Stewart dies, we'll never find out what happens in Star Trek Picard. So just, just think about that before you wish death on the boomers. This graph here explains uh, why it is so important to slow the spread of the virus. You might have seen this graph around already, but I want to be thorough and explain everything. So this dotted line is the capacity of the healthcare system. It's the number of respirators, the number of beds. If you become seriously ill with COVID-19, you get pneumonia, and then you need a respirator to continue breathing. The death rates shoot up if you do not have access to that respirator. So if we just let this virus spread, we didn't call off public events, we didn't wash our hands extra, we get something like this first curve, this uncontrolled transmission. As you can see, it just busts right through the capacity of the healthcare system, and that leads to a, a lot more deaths. If, on the other hand, we can slow the spread, we can keep it under the healthcare system's capacity and avoid a lot of unnecessary deaths. That's what we're trying to do. So I want to talk about the UK government. Unfortunately, my government, I didn't vote for them. I, I voted to leave the UK, but um, my government and what they're doing. So a lot of countries around the world have been uh, you know, bringing in these really strict quarantines, uh, 
closing down public events, closing pubs and restaurants. America and Britain, both countries with very right-wing governments, have both been very slow to react. I want to talk about the potential effects of that and then talk about why I think that is. Uh, so you shouldn't really listen to me. I'm just some idiot on YouTube. But this guy here, Anthony Costello, he is a former director of the World Health Organization. And he's a professor. And he works for The Lancet, which is a health journal. So we're going to listen to him. Bloomberg reports here, the UK government's strategy to tackle the outbreak will need almost 40 million Britons to catch the disease to work, according to the country's top scientific advisor. This is the idea that people are going to become immune from catching the disease, which is actually not something that we know happens for sure yet. Uh, and therefore, if we just let everyone get infected, it will be okay. That's a catastrophe. Um, but that's a quick tweet. He goes into more depth here. So let's start at the top. Uh, unlike all other countries, the UK strategy aims to build herd immunity by allowing the steady spread of COVID-19. The government argue it will block a second peak in several months' time. Here are eight questions. Will it impair efforts to restrict the immediate epidemic and cause more infections and deaths in the near term? Evidence suggests people shed virus early and those without symptoms may cause substantial spread so that's where before you have symptoms you can already be infecting people that's why policies against mass gatherings school closures social distancing distancing have worked in china in south korea will it weaken containment systems does coronavirus cause herd immunity or is it like flu where new strains emerge every year we don't know. Doesn't the herd immunity conflict with WHO policy? Dr Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization, said the idea that countries should shift from containment to mitigation is wrong and dangerous. Our government is wrong and dangerous. China have managed to contain it. Shouldn't we wait and see what the results from that are? Vaccines are a safer way to develop herd immunity without the risks associated with the disease itself. Is it ethical to adopt a policy that threatens immediate casualties on the basis of an uncertain future benefit? I mean, I think he's laid it out pretty well. What Britain is doing and what America is doing is absurd. It doesn't, doesn't stack up. Now, maybe they've got more plans they're not telling us about. I think if that's the case, that's pretty shocking in, the, in a democracy. Um, but there's, we're going to have to take these measures. Like the, the NHS cannot cope with 40 million people becoming ill, something like 10 to 20% of them needing hospital treatment over the course of, of a matter of a few months. There aren't enough beds. There aren't enough respirators. And we've seen what's happened in Italy where uh, they've got beds lining the hospital corridors. Th th this is where I am scared. Not really for my own health. I'll probably be okay. But just for the whole country. This is Devi Sridhar. I hope I pronounced that right, Devi. She is a professor and chair of global public health at Edinburgh University Medical School. She says part of my job is speaking truth to power. And the UK government is, in my view, getting it wrong. Other countries have shown speed is crucial. There is a middle path between complete shutdown and carrying on as normal. And she lays out a middle path. Increased testing and contact tracing. That's where, if you're diagnosed with coronavirus, they then find everyone you've met in the last week and quarantine them as well. Stop large public gatherings. Stop non-essential travel. Encourage employers to allow home working. Uh, and clearer advice for older people and people with other conditions. So this is another public health expert. This is two in a row UK public health experts saying that the UK government is getting it wrong, that they need to take stronger action now before the situation gets worse. So that's, that's kind of the background, and I want to talk about the politics. 
why is this happening? I think the answer is actually kind of simple. This is it here. Here's the FTSE 100 index. Past year of it. Since last month, it's fallen off a cliff. And especially in the last few days. Here's the Dow Jones stock market index. Exact same thing. This is happening all around the world. And for our politicians, especially the right wing ones, this is horrible. That, they're much more scared of this than they are of a million deaths. Much more scared. Because this is their friends. This is the people that they have dinner parties with and the people who fund their political campaigns. This matters to them more than whether you live or die or whether your gran lives or dies. But there's something deeper than that. In the UK, the, apparently a lot of advice is being given by this thing called the nudge unit. Now, the nudge unit is a quasi-privatised, semi-privatised, quasi-government behavioural psychology team. And its job is to nudge the UK population into doing things without the government having to tell them to do those things. So apparently their advice in this case is that if we uh, do too much social distancing too early, people will get bored um, and that will cause problems down the line. Like Maybe that's true, but it seems to me that this is the authoritarianism that you come up with when you've decided that you can't have any authority. When you believe that there is no society, as Margaret Thatcher said, then it's not okay for society to elect government and that government to put in place rules that apply to everybody. Instead, we've got to be left to make our own decisions and live or die on our own account. And you see this across everything. Uh, you know, pensions is a great example. It would be so much simpler, and I think life would be so much easier if the government pension was just plenty to live on. If it was just a like, if it was just a good wage that you could get by on, and you paid your taxes, and then when you retired, you got the government pension. But instead, we've all got to have private pensions. And we've all meant to make decisions about which fund we put them in. Uh, and then, you know, if the stock market collapses and we lose every penny of our pension, well, you know, you should have made better decisions. What were you doing putting it in the stock market? And it's a bit like that. Instead of just putting in place a collective system that we all adhere to, we're, we're all to be just gently guided by the nudge unit, the very clever men at the nudge unit will just help us to make the right decisions for ourselves. But we have the freedom, the freedom to make the wrong decision, end up without a pension or end up sick. Lucky us. The problem with rules for these people, I, I think, they might not admit it, but I think the problem is that rules apply equally, whether you're rich or poor. If there's a ban on going like, outside except when it's essential, if it's a rule, oh, well, then that, you know, everyone has to follow that, even the important people. Whereas if it's a nudge, it's for the little people who aren't as, aren't as clever as those of us with money. This is where the essentially libertarian philosophy of Thatcherism has brought us. And you're very likely to blame yourself if something goes wrong. Uh, something the Bernie Sanders campaign has been really focusing on is trying to persuade people that their problems aren't their fault. You know, the fact that you've gone bankrupt over healthcare isn't your fault. It's not just you. It's hundreds of thousands. It's millions of people. And it's a problem with the system. It's not your fault. So that's the first part of the politics here, um, a, a collapse in the sense of a public realm and public goods. And the next thing is what's happening with the economy, because th this stock market fall isn't good news for you or me. 
Uh, you know, I don't have any money in the stock market, um, but it's going to knock on. And all this closing down and staying inside, that's going to have a big impact. I have friends who work in industries like you know, music. One very good friend of mine is a sound engineer. Uh, my wife does uh, massage and people are cancelling gigs and they're cancelling tours and they're cancelling appointments and that's a lot of income being lost to a lot of people who are quite economically vulnerable people who don't have lots of savings uh, people who don't have pay when there's no work you know people who are self-employed as we've all been told to be and that's going to ripple right through the economy you know at one end of it okay I'm not sure if I'll have work this month so I'm not going to spend money on as, on as many things. Maybe I have to borrow on a credit card. Okay, now the businesses that I would have been paying money to are now not getting the income. So what, they go to their landlords and maybe ask for a rent holiday. Uh, they maybe ask their suppliers to defer payment. And that will ripple right through the economy, this kind of bubbling of debt at every level of it. And that's a recipe for catastrophe. There's not a lot that the, the government can do about it. What governments try to do is to bring down the headline rate of interest. Um, but that's not what you or I are paying on our credit cards or our mortgages uh, or what small businesses are paying. It's meant to trickle down, but there's not a lot of evidence of that happening. Uh, and there's better alternatives out there. Vietnam are doing free food deliveries for people in quarantine. Like, how simple and lovely is that? Um, but that's a government that knows it's running a society, not just a collection of individuals. So my quick fix for the economic catastrophe that's following this health catastrophe uh, would be that the government should borrow the money because the money's going to be borrowed, right? Like, we're going to be deferring payments. We're going to be putting money on credit cards and overdrafts. And rather than all of us individually and all the small businesses individually taking on those debts, we should do it together as a society. It's fairer. Uh, it's more secure because governments usually don't go bankrupt. And it would be really cheap. The thing about money coming out of the stock market is it does have to go somewhere. And one of the places it goes is government bonds. That is government debt. And that makes government debt cheaper so this is american government bonds three month interest rate 0.24 percent even the 30 year 1.57 percent that is that's almost free you've got to take inflation off that so if if inflation is half a percent which should be very low by historic standards um, over the long term it's averaged about two percent then that that half a percent debt, that's, you know, two-year bonds for free. Just borrow the money. UK, same picture. 0.26%, 0.4%, 0.86%. The UK can near enough borrow for 30 years for free or close enough to free. Let's do that. Give it to people. Do a universal basic income. Why not? We're either going to take this debt on collectively you know, accepting that we can't do as much work as we usually would do in the next two or three months as, as a country, as a world. So we're either going to take that debt on individually or we're going to take it on all together. And if we take it on all together, it will cost all of us less. The repayments will be fairer because it will come out of taxes. Uh, and if we don't do it, there's a real risk that the system just kind of shudders to a halt. In summary... Don't panic. Do help the people around you. Do wash your hands. Um, but challenge your governments because their response condemns the entire ideological project of the last 40 years. It really shows all of its weaknesses. We do live in a society and the, all of our health depends on the, the least among us. If every homeless person and poor person 
an immigrant in your city isn't protected from coronavirus, then you're not protected from coronavirus. It's something we can only solve collectively by helping everyone. Thanks.